should have uh, good timing in terms of hearing a great talk from Lisa Spar and then going over to the dining hall for some drinks and then dinner. So thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, I have, I've only met Lisa one time, and we were both at a meeting together in Charlottesville uh, last June. Uh, there's a group I'm in called the Country Day School Headmasters Association, and, they, and that group meets annually at a different university each year, and I like being part of it because you get to see a lot of different universities, and you get to see kind of the insides of the universities because the, the schools like to show the heads of the schools a lot about their university. And we have talks for uh, the two or three days that we're there, and they typically have professors at the university come speak to us. And you would think that most, I haven't had this conversation with Lisa, but you would think that most of the headmasters would be pretty sensitive and tuned in to poetry. But actually, they're not. <laughs> and the reason for that, just to kind of give you the inside information on heads of schools, is you know that the, head, the heads of schools have you know, morphed a little bit into the CEO role. And there are very few heads of schools who teach these days. And so I was particularly interested in how her talk would resonate with that group of people. Uh, because it was about poetry. And you would think they'd be pretty tuned in, but, and they were. And it made me think that it would be a really great thing to have Lisa come speak to MBA. One of the nice sort of serendipities to getting to know her uh, and asking her to come is that she has a colleague uh, in the English department whom I know very well, but I haven't seen him in about 25 or 30 years. And so our reconnection, our connection has now reconnected the two of us. And I will see him sometime soon, and he's flying his children in to meet us uh, from different parts of the country. So that's been a really nice part of this. So she runs a poetry program at Virginia. She uh, is a graduate of Virginia. And uh, she uh, has brought, or we brought, down a book that she's just put together uh, about Jefferson and Monticello uh, that has a number of poems in it. I assume you'll allude to the book in some of your comments. So please join me in welcoming you. So I was going to go up there. It's a little UN, uh, I think. And should I go up there? Are you sure? OK. I just I like Brad's style. And I'll see if I can do this. I don't see very well. Um, but thank you for having me. And um, I actually wanted to just follow up a little bit about that meeting. Um, my dean, our dean of admission at Virginia had called on me and said, you know, there, this group of heads of school from around the country is coming. Um, we, we were gathering together some uh, faculty from different disciplines. Would you mind giving a little talk? And so I ended up talking about, I think, the, um, what's the work, I think it was, what's uh, poetry, but it's, what's it, what's it worth? And the part, that talk really grew out of uh, my growing up in a family of scientists and um, f always feeling a little bit odd and living among very intelligent people who are afraid of poetry. Uh, you know, my dad was a brilliant research chemist, but um, show him a poem and he, you know, <laughs> run for his life. And partly I think he felt that poems were out to trick him. Uh, but one of the things, a point I mentioned, uh, is that even though the doctor poet William Carlos Williams, uh, who was a doctor and a poet, said that it's difficult to get the news from poems, but men and women die every day for lack of what is found there, um, I, 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 I really think that well, I'll just put, put it this way. When I was directing the creative writing program, every couple of weeks I'd get a phone call from someone from the community saying, my daughter's getting married. Can you recommend a poem? Or my mother just died, and can you tell me what was that poem that they read in Four Weddings and a Funeral? I'd really like to use that. And so when big things happen to us, we turn to poems because they do say things in a way that they say the things that almost can't be said. But what I really loved about talking with the heads of school was I was a little nervous about it, actually. I mean, if you can imagine this room full of 
uh, really bright people, but they were, they'd been, like you, going to meetings all day. And I thought, they're not really going to want to sit and listen to talk, me talk about poetry. But it was the, one of the best audiences I've ever uh, with, w had a conversation with. And so that's how, what I'm imagining for tonight, is just maybe talking for about 20 minutes about this new project, actually, and then leaving some time for conversation so that we can take the, uh, this in whichever direction we'd like to go. But just to. After that talk, I had to go to the UVA bookstore. You can get a lot of things at UVA bookstore, among them books, but Clinique products, you know, hosiery, uh, whatever. And I think I needed, I forget what I needed. But anyway, I went over there and they said, you know, this, we, you, we were thronged after your talk. There's nobody like a headmaster in search of a book. And so they sold every book that I had ever written that the bookstore had in stock. And they had more on order. And it was really just the great um, Elan Vital of the, of the heads of school. And you have a, a remarkable one, so very grateful. Um, I also wanted to just say that, in, to thank some people, um, Brad, of course, and then Jennifer, I don't know if you're here, but Jennifer Howell, who made this all happen, Wynne Bassett uh, and Gracie, and then Brad's wife, Minna, who's been helping me warm up my little log cabin, and Michael Bass, who, um, who fetched me today from the airport amidst the snow. Another fun thing um, is just that in my communications with Jennifer, there will be MBA in the subject line. And that's kind of fun for people who are in creative writing because um, you know, an MFA is what we offer our students, which is a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. But I have had one student in particular whose parents were so upset that she was, had chosen to get an MFA and not an MBA that at cocktail parties, they refused to say MFA. They would say, they would say, well, how's Katie? What's she doing? And they'd say, well, she's getting her MBA. So it made me feel very, um, very smart to have to be sort of to have that MBA there in the subject line. And finally, among all the many things I'd like to talk to you about, and I don't know whether we'll have time, it's just this idea of educating young men and raising sons and how important that is um, and how important the humanities are. Humanities help make human beings real to one another. And so that in addition to all, and really there is no precinct that's outside the realm of humanities, whether it's athletics, hard science, soft science, whatever, we're all engaged in the act of being human. Um, but there are ways in which the study of poetry um, can lead to a kind of emotional literacy that I think is really important uh, for young men. I have one son, and he's sandwiched between two really bright, energetic daughters. And I had sisters and uh, one brother who came along when I was 13, so I was leaving home by the time he arrived. And I didn't know about boys. I didn't know what to do with them. You know, when hair started growing on their legs, and their voice, they grew a foot one summer. And um, but. You know, he's a remarkable young person, and I you know, feel grateful to uh, have been part of uh, you know, being a steward of him. Uh, but anyway, we can talk maybe about that later. What I'm he here excited about is this book that um, is out in the lobby. It's not anywhere else at, except the warehouses of the University of Virginia Press. It literally just got published a couple of days ago. I had to run over to the University of Virginia Press yesterday to get my own copy so that I would have one to bring to show you. And leave it to Jennifer Howell and uh, Montgomery Bell to actually get you know some 30 copies of the book and have it uh, out of the lobby, I think. Um, so in addition to teaching, which I've been doing since 1980, and writing my own poems, um, I'm I really love anthologizing poems. And I like to work on anthologies of poems while I'm working on my own poems. I think the part of me that enjoys a good dinner party uh, is, is behind this instinct I have to anthologize. It's sort of like, I'm interested in poems about London. I'm interested in poems about insomnia. I'm interested in poems about jazz. Um, who's writing those poems? Who wrote them 500 years ago? Who's writing them now? Who can I seat together? Who will dance together? How can I make these poems speak to one another? Um, and so I've, I've done a number of anthologies. And I brought one of them um, because I wanted to give it to Brad. Um, 
this is just a little book of poems I edited of insomnia poems. Um, I don't sleep well, and a lot of other people don't sleep well, apparently. And this book uh, spans, you know, centuries of people uh, who who don't who didn't sleep well. So a lot of times, when we think of anthologizing, which means basically to gather flowers, anthologizing means a bouquet. So it's a gathering of verses. Um, it's usually something big and fat, like the Norton Anthology of Literature, right, where it's historical and you're proceeding from the beginning to the end. The anthologies I put together are more thematic and more interested in a subject. Um, but it, if it's going to have a, it has to have a so what, right, about it. So for sleeplessness, I think the insomniac wants to be awake while others are asleep, like poets. Um, the insomniac can have a kind of bully pride about her insomnia or his insomnia, which can sort of fade after a few sleepless nights. Um, but I think that that notion of wanting to uh, see in the dark and also maybe to ward off the big sleep that the little sleep each night portends, death, love and death, the big themes of poetry, sort of behind that. This book is called Monticello in Mind. Um, I've, of course, I knew about Thomas Jefferson when I was a girl. I read about him. I studied about him in school. My grandmother was from Philadelphia, so I spent a lot of time in Philadelphia visiting places where he wrote and worked. Um, I had an aunt uh, on the Lewis side, on my mother's side, who claims that I'm, we're descendants of Jefferson, but then isn't everyone. Um, and, but then I did go to the University of Virginia shortly after women were admitted in the in the 70s. And one of the first things I did was take a trip up to Monticello to visit um, the home that Jefferson spent 30 plus years building and tearing down and building again. And then over the years, since, those, since the 1970s, I've visited countless times um, Monticello, partly with visiting poets, uh, ranging from Allen Ginsberg, which you can imagine was interesting, to um, Seamus Heaney, the award-winning Irish uh, Nobel Prize-winning poet. People, when people come to Charlottesville, they want to go up there. Also, I have three children, so I've been on many, many, many field trips uh, up to Monticello. And I don't, you can't live in, in Charlottesville, Virginia, and not have to deal with this man. Uh, there are cocktails named after him, sandwiches named after him. There's a big tombstone company that's the Jefferson you know, Memorial Tombstone Company. He lends his name to insurance salesmen. And he's just, he's ubiquitous. He's everywhere. And he's complicated and paradoxical. And I felt that I wanted to start dealing with him in some way. Um, I felt I owed it to him and, I, and to myself. And so I became attuned. To, every time I would see a poem about Jefferson or Monticello, I would sort of make a note of it. And I had gathered about 15, I would, I would say. And then, I don't know, maybe five years ago or so, I had this idea that I would write to 50 of my poetry friends and ask them to write something about Thomas Jefferson uh, that I didn't give them any restrictions uh, as to subject matter or anything, length, whatever. And uh, I sent out a, a, a top 50 list. And of that top 50, almost everybody uh, agreed. And I think that Jefferson has always been a kind of pinata figure, even since he was president. And uh, in the culture wars and in the history wars, he's beloved by some and sort of revered. And he's also demonized by others. And I wanted to see what poets writing in the 21st century might have to say about this person and how that might reveal to us some of the ways, some of the issues that plagued America when it was founded, the experiment, the American experiment, still are with us. And um, so I included in here a few poems that had already been published. Uh, but they all had to be published and written by people writing in the 20, mid, from the mid-20th on through the 21st century. The youngest person in this book is 26, and the oldest person in this book is dead, <laughs> uh, would be Laureen Niedeker. But um, I also have Charles Wright, who just turned 80 this year, so, uh, and he's a Tennessee boy, so I, I may read his poem. Jefferson loved poetry, and um, he was a well-educated young man who was probably... Um, his, the kind of education he received was probably not all that different from the kind of education 
the men receive, the young men receive here at Montgomery Bell, and that it was, um, it involved everything, the full spectrum of classical uh, history, the classics, history, science, athletics, everything. Now Jefferson is famous for saying that he didn't think that any game played with a ball was worth doing. Um, and I always joke with my husband, who's a big football player fan, about that. But of course, when you think about it, in the 18th century, games played with balls were kind of silly. Um, they didn't have soccer or football at that time. He loved poetry, and he kept scrapbooks of poems, commonplace books, where he would write down excerpts from poems that he liked. Uh, they usually had to do with his troubles with women. Um, and that was while he was a student at William and Mary. Um, he also was a compulsive collector of everything, which might owe to his house having burned down when he was a boy in Shadwell. And then he had lost all the, his books, and he had to sort of reassemble them. Um, he also newspapers published poetry. I think that we find that strange, but can you imagine opening, you know, USA Today and seeing a poem by one of the poet laureates, you know, published there. And, but newspapers regularly published poems. And when he was president, Jefferson had made these famous scrapbooks. You know, he would cut out poems that spoke to him about different things. And one critic said, you know, when we read those scrapbooks of Jefferson's poems, we're reading, our, we're reading ourselves reading him. Um, so uh, uh, Jefferson was a writer. I was talking with one of you about that before. Like of all the founding fathers, the reason they kept him, he was, he was not a very good public speaker, apparently. Um, he wasn't an orator. They, other founding fathers were better at that. But he was a beautiful writer. So thus, the Declaration of Independence and um, many other documents we owe to him. When he died, um, the same day that Adams died, his good friend, 4th of July, interestingly, his last <coughs> gestures were of writing in the air. And this was recorded by people who were with him. So right from the beginning of his life, throughout his life, um, he was, uh, he considered himself a writer and was particularly fond of poetry. He himself wasn't a very good poet, um, but he did write poetry. And I thought I would read the one poem that um, we believe is his. Uh, he wrote it for his daughter, Martha, who took care of him toward the end of his life. Life's visions are vanished, its dreams are no more. Dear friends of my bosom, why bathed in tears? I go to my father's, I welcome the shore, which crowns all my hopes or which buries my cares. Then farewell, my dear, my loved daughter, adieu. The last pang in life is in parting from you. Two seraphs await me, long shrouded in death. I will bear them your love on my last parting breath. So, you know, it's very traditional, very sort of European influenced. But an, somebody else, uh, another biographer of Jefferson's, went through his garden books and, and took out some of his notations. And I'm just going to read one of these to you because it kind of reads like a contemporary poem. Purple hyacinth begins to bloom, Narcissus and Pacoon. Pacoon flowers fallen, a bluish colored, funnel formed flower in low grounds blooming. Purple flag blooms, hyacinth and narcissus are gone. Wild honeysuckle in our woods open, also the dwarf flag and violets. Blue flower in low grounds vanished. The purple flag, dwarf flag, violet and wild honeysuckle still in bloom. And it even looks sort of in its broken form, unmetrical, whatever, free verse, like a little bit of free verse poetry. But what I'd like to do today, I don't want to keep you too long, is um, I'd like just to read a couple of poems from this, because in a way, this is the launch of this book. Um, nobody else has seen it. And so thank you for allowing me to um, tell you a little bit about it. I, there is an introduction to the book that I wrote that will tell you a lot more than I want to take your time to tell you today. This book is going to be adopted for classroom use. So in the back of the book is a biography of every poet included, including an annotation that I make about the poems involved. So that's to help teachers as well as, um, as uh, students understand maybe some of the poems involved. Um, when I said that people are afraid of poetry, I wanted to say that it's not just you know my scientist dad who doesn't read poetry. It's English teachers 
I mean, a lot of us are afraid of poetry because we think it's subjective and it doesn't solve for one answer. And it's complex if it's doing its job, it's multi-layered, and that's frightening to people, especially if you're trying to teach something. So um, it was hard to pick poems, but I thought I would start with a poem by Robert Hass, um, who is a California poet, but he lived at, in Charlottesville for a while. And in some ways, um, this poem, I think, is, um, well, he does some fun things. He imagines Jefferson being alive and like trawling through the aisles of Kmart, the Charlottesville Kmart, looking for uh, pulleys and things. There's a mention here of Meriwether Lewis, who um, you know, was, went out on that famous exp ex uh, expedition and is uh, believed to have maybe killed himself or been possibly murdered. Anyway, I don't think this poem requires a lot of explanation. Monticello. Snow is falling on the age of reason on Tom Jefferson's little hill and on the age of sensibility. Jane Austen isn't walking in the park. She considers that this gray crust of an horizon will not do. She is by the fire reading William Cooper and Jefferson, if he isn't dead, has gone down to Kmart to browse among the gadgets, pulleys, levers, the separation of powers. I try to think of history the mammoth jawbone in the entry hall, Napoleon in marble, Meriwether Lewis dead at Grinder's Trace. I don't want the powers separated, one wing for Governor Randolph when he comes, the other wing for love, private places in the public wheel that ache against the teeth like ice. Outside this monument, the snow catches star-shaped, in the leaves of old magnolias. So this is one of the poems that actually I found before I solicited poems for the book. Um, and a lot of the poems that ended up coming in in response to my invitation refer to this poem, talk back to it. So I like when that happens. So there's kind of a legacy involved. Um, I mentioned that I didn't give the poets I asked any restrictions. I did try to pick a range of poets, lots of African-American poets. Uh, there are Indian, uh, Native American poets, um, India, Indian po Amer American poets, just, a, and a, again, a whole range. But as you might expect, lots of poems came in about race, lots of poems about Sally Hemings, um, and lots of poems about Monticello, the house itself, because it's such a, an amazing sort of architectural feat. And a lot of people wrote about uh, Jefferson's Bible, and I don't know if you guys, how many of you have heard of this, but Jefferson, you know, Mr. Enlightenment, uh, went through the New Testament. He went through it in Latin, in Greek, in French, and English, and he excised from the New Testament everything that had to do with a miracle, anything that couldn't be sort of rationally explained. And so it's interesting that poets found that interesting. And there's a kind of a movement in contemporary poetry now called erasure and cut and paste, where you take an extant document and then you take parts of it away and you sort of create something out of it. And I think that that might explain one reason. And also a lot of people writing using Jefferson's words because he was such a, an amazing writer. Um, okay, so um, a couple more. I thought I might read, um, I feel like I should read uh, this poem by Kate Daniels. Does anybody know Kate? She teaches at Vanderbilt. Yeah. And she, this is a bit longer, um, but I think it's sort of a very moving poem. And it's about um, a, the speaker in the poem has a son who suffers from being bipolar. So it is a very much a poem about boys and about an adolescent boy and, um, and about a, how his parents try to cope with his difficulties. And while she's, they're doing that, while they're coping with the difficulties and the split that the son is feeling, um, she's thinking about Jefferson and how he seemed to be of two minds as well. Reading a biography of Thomas Jefferson in the months of my son's recovery, because he bought the great swath of mucky swamp and marshy wetland on the southern edge of the territory, then let it alone so it could fulminate over time into its queer patchwork, private self. Because he forged a plowshare from paranoia about the motivations of Napoleon, 
declined to incite a war and approved instead a purchase order. Because he would have settled for New Orleans, but acquired the whole thing anyway through perseverance and hard bargaining and not being too close with the government's money, because he bought it all, half a million acres, sight unseen. Because he loved great silences and alligators and bustling ports and unfettered access to commerce and international trade and bowery, stone-paved courtyards, noisy with clattering palms and formal drawing rooms, cooled with high ceilings and shuttered windows, furnished in the lush, upholstered style of Louis Kant's, because he valued imported wines and dark-brewed coffees and had a tongue that understood those subtle differences, but still found himself thrilled as a child by the strange, uncatalogued creatures that crawled and swam and winged themselves through the native territory. Because of all of this, I return thanks to Thomas Jefferson for his flawed example of human greatness, for the mind-boggling diversity of Louisiana, birthplace of my second son, 13th of December, 1990, the largest child delivered to the state that day. Can't help drawing back at how he lived in two minds, because he was of two minds, like a person with old-time manic depression, the slaveholder and the Democrat, the tranquil hilltop of Monticello and the ringing cobblestones of Paris, France, the white wife and the black slave mistress. Before he was my son, he was contained within a clutch of dangling eggs that waited all a tremble for his father's transforming glob of universal glue. From the beginning, before the beginning, before he had arranged himself into a fetal entity and began to grow inside me, he was endangered by the mind-breaking molecules our ancestors hoarded and passed forward in a blameless game of chance, shuffling the genes. Even then, two minds circulated inside him, tantalizing his brand new victim with generations of charged up narratives of drugs and drink, of suicide and mania, of melancholic unmodulated moods, bedeviling distant aunts who died early and wild cousins who loved their night drives on dark roads with no headlights on, speedometer straining to the arc of its limit. Mothers who danced on the dining room table kicking aside the Thanksgiving turkey they had carefully basted hours before. We marveled at him in his bassinet, such an unsoothable infant, so unreconciled to breathing oxygen, wearing a diaper, waiting for milk, still small and manageable at first, but whirling moods, baby-sized and effervescent as the liminal clouds of early spring, stalked him even then. Even then, this thing stalked him, threatening his freedom and his right to self-rule. And here she quotes Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Before we were ourselves, he knew us, explained us to ourselves, gave us a language whereby we understood the restless grandiosities of our forebears and set us off on our well-trod personal path of liberty and greedy freedom-seeking minted the metaphors we go on living by and misinterpreting and clobbering over the heads of the rest of the world. Still, his language stirs me up. Still, I believe he was a great man and seek in the painful contradictions of his personal life and public service, ongoing signs for how to live in this strange era. Sometimes it helps to latch on to someone else's vision in a crisis, the way I did at Monticello so long ago, stumbling on, along the rain-slicked bricks of orderly paths, working-class girl in cheap shoes and plastic glasses, bad teeth, terrified by the new world of the mind I'd entered. From the strict arrangements and smoothed-out edges of all those interwoven pavers, someone baked from clay, carted there, laid out by hand, brick by brick, I carved a small sanity where I could rest and read. And then here's Jefferson again. 
I know of no safe depository of the ultimate powers of society but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. Once more, we drive our son to the treatment center and sign him in and watch him stripped of identity and privacy, shoelaces and cigarettes, cell phone, a dog-eared novel by Cormac McCarthy, a plastic bag stuffed with things we take away with us and weep over driving home. He has lost the safe depository of himself. He is dispossessed, is lacking any wholesome discretion on his own behalf. Indicted by genetics, disempowered by blood, how should we school him except by love and psychotropic medication? In the long nights when I can't sleep, when anxiety courses through my body, ratcheting up to a stiff rod of fear and dread, I feel impaled upon. I sometimes let my mind drift to Thomas Jefferson and his famous inconsistency. Here he is, tranquilly trotting through the bracing sunlight of national history, all long bones and red hair, the eloquent incitements of his discourse, scrolling out the documents of that that determined our fate. And there he is at night, other mind in ascendance, tying the bed curtains of a lover he inventoried among his personal property, with whom he made six children, though he owned her, and then owned them, his own sons and daughters. The way that two things can coexist without canceling each other out, how did he live like that? How does my own son live like that? As a school child longs for certainty, I crave an answer and sometimes hold my two hands up to weigh the yes and the no. Slavery in the one hand, freedom in the other, a tiny exercise in bipolarity that never helps. I cannot live without books, he wrote, and so gave permission for a kind of life previously unimaginable this life I live now, soothing myself among my many volumes. I just felt that that was a long poem and grateful to you for sitting through, but also young men, men in crisis, education, the value of accepting that we're full of paradoxes and contradictions, each one of us. Um, it seemed important to read that poem. So what I'd like to do now is just, um, I, I, I'm not a fan, I don't put myself in my own anthologies, a lot of people do that. Um, in, in fact, um, I brought along a little verse, uh, one E.E. E. Cummings, everybody knows E.E. E. Cummings, right, from high school. He got angry with an anthologizer once for not including him in one of his um, anthologies, even though the anthologizer put several of his own poems in the book, Mr. Uh, Untermeyer, Louis Untermeyer. So this is, this is a little poem by, um, E.E. E. Cummings, Mr. You, that would be Mr. Untermeyer. Mr. You will not be missed. This is a eulogy for him. Right? Mr. You will not be missed, who as an anthologist sold the many on the few, not excluding Mr. You. So, um, all right. So anyway, I don't do that. I don't put myself in my own books, even though, of course, I write in so many poems. Of course, I write poems about London and whatever. And I, I do have a Jefferson poem, so I thought I'd read it to you. And then I thought we'd do, we could stop and then see if you have any questions. If you want to talk a little bit more about anthologizing or uh, Jefferson or, uh, you know, just about uh, anything, poetry, whatever. Uh, or uh, so, all right. So Jefferson had, had, um, this might seem unfathomable to us, those of us who live in the part of the world we live in, but when Jefferson was growing up uh, on Monticello Mountain, he didn't, uh, there were no mockingbirds there, right? And so he purchased, when he was still a young man, 29, still, he was, wife was still alive, he had a baby, he purchased from the Tidewater area uh, a mockingbird, a singing, a singing mockingbird, like a pet. And, um, and then over the years, he is known to have had about five or six 
such mockingbirds. And he believed the mocking, he loved Native American birds. And the whole time that he was in France, he was always saying, oh, well, the nightingale's really nice, but you should hear the birds of Virginia, you know. Um, and so he had this series of birds. And uh, when he was president, he had them in the Oval Office. There was a mockingbird who would like, he kept it in a cage when people came. But then when they weren't there, he, the mockingbird would hop around. and. He would teach it to sing, and it would follow when he'd leave and go upstairs to go to bed. It would, this is almost cartoonish, but it would climb up after him, you know, like up the stairs. And um, if you know anything about Jefferson, too, he, he was named everything. And he named his horses and his dogs, and they were all named after Greek gods and whatever. But when I was researching these mockingbirds, I discovered that he named the one that he liked, his favorite mockingbird, he named Dick. Right, you know. So after being Characteroctus and you know Epictetus and stuff, all his horses had these grand names. He had this very nice, precise name for his little mock, his favorite mockingbird. Um, the bird would hop around the dinner table. It would eat from Jefferson's lips, and then Jefferson would take it into the drawing room and teach it and play the violin and stuff. So they teach the bird to sing. Um, I read that when he went to Paris, he took a mockingbird with him. You know how mockingbirds are. I mean, they're they're mockingbirds, so they learn to sing, and they're beautiful singers. And they show off, but apparently, the, his mockingbird learned to imitate the creaking of the of the ship uh, trestles. <laughs> so it's not all beautiful. But um, anyway, I know that with my own kids, uh, mockingbirds are everywhere now, and uh, Jefferson likes to take credit for bringing the mockingbird to. Charlottesville. Um, but I noticed that when I would be out in the yard with my kids when they were little, that the, the mockingbirds were, would make noises that sounded like my kids playing in the wading pool or like cell phones, things like that. I mean, they're very quite, quite remarkable. So the only thing, um, this is about, uh, this is a quotation from um, uh, Jefferson wrote, would keep in his diary, the Orleans bird sings, uh, old mock bird sings, middle aged bird sings, and then finally, March 3rd, 1808, when he's 65, he writes, Dick Sings. So at the risk of sounding naughty, I called this poem Dick Sings. Um, and it's uh, a reference to that, um, that notation in his book. And it just describes the mockingbird as this little musical instrument, almost. And the only thing you might need to know is Montrachet is a particular um, wine that he was a big wine fan, although he claims to have only consumed it in moderation tried to grow it up on Monticello. And then, so that word is there, Montrachet. And then also, there was a song he liked to play on the fiddle. Uh, he apparently was not very good violin player, but he liked to think he was. And he played this uh, tune called Money Musk, which is a popular tune of the day. We know that because we have it written out in his hand. Later, one of Thomas Jefferson's sons, or well, one of Sally Hemings' sons, so we think might have been also Jefferson's son, was, was a musician and played that Money Musk was his, was his sort of secret uh, or his signature piece. So you'll hear that title in here. Dick sings, now agog, now fervent, eager, trapezed, these squeeze bock theatrics emit from a grotto of tulip poplar, the hour not long enough for this erected cultivation in air of soul music unbridled from such a spry pocket, unblunted kit, Nutshell patches, shivering torrents, athletic above the dull humidity, tourist mill. And just as Jefferson's darling shuffle tapped the tabletop, nipped meat from his lips, later translating for guests the gypsy timbre of that complex tongue, mantrache, rail fence, forged declaration, clock tick, as minutes ride this stalwart minstrel, he struck up Money Musk uncaged song that history's fiddle plays around. So um, anyway, there's, I, there's so much more to talk about, but I know you've been meeting since noon, if not before. Um, is, can I answer any questions you might have, either about this project? Um, as I said, I think, unbelievably, um, there are copies of this out in the hallway, so you're welcome to, I'd be happy to sign it um, if you're interested in it. Any questions or that or just about UVA or poetry or, or, jo or Jefferson, lots of mythology you have him. For sure. <coughs> yes. First of all, what age uh, student are you typically reading? Are you reading uh, freshman? At, at UVA? Mm -hmm. I do everything. 
Um, every summer, I teach in a program that for gifted high school students. And I do that. People think I'm crazy, but I do it because I feel like I care about high school kids, and I want to know who they are. And I want to know who they are when they come into UVA, how they're learning, how they're gathering information, um, and so forth. So, and then I always teach a first year class of first year. So I have. And that's what I was thinking. How well prepared and how well versed in poetry or literature in general are those first year students? That's a really good question. I would say that the students who come out of independent schools are better <coughs> educated and they know more about poetry. And that's because their faculty members are real, pe real scholars and um, the real writers. And so they're, they become acquainted with that. And I, almost to a person, every, I can tell after with that first year class, you know, and I'll bring in a bunch of poems about, it's a, co a course called Myths of Adolescence and the Literary Imagination. And I, I give them poetry just to start with. And the students who have recognized, oh yes, this is Seamus Heaney, this is Robert Half, this is Charles Wright, whatever or older stuff, they, I, I know that they've gone to St. Christopher or Montgomery Bell or, you know, that they've been educated like that. Um, when I went to school, I'm, you know, a child of the 50s. We memorized poems in school. Uh, I don't know if anybody else here had to do that, but we, we had to recite poems. We had to memorize them and recite them. Uh, and I'm glad of that because I, I got that poetry inside me. So now, I learned in the fifth grade whose woods these are. I think I know his house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch this woods fall up. So, and I, I still think almost every day that line, I'm miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep, means something more to me now as I'm 60 than it did to me when I was in fifth grade learning it. Um, but, you know, it, again, you know, that to go back to where I started, you know, it's difficult to get the news from poems, but people die every day. Well, probably not really. People are dying every day because they don't read poetry. But I do think that, again, like poetry offers us a way of understanding experience that is inimitable and mem memorable. Um, that beautiful Kate Daniels poem, it's not, it doesn't have the, con the con condensation of, you know, nothing gold can stay or something like that. But it's, you know, you could put all of that in a novel, or you could read that poem and understand so much about Jefferson, but also about the difficulties faced by anybody suffering from bipolarity. And who, ha and who which one of us, who hasn't, you know, if we're lucky and we're not severely ill, who hasn't been of two minds about something at one point or another? And poetry is good for that, because it reminds you that you can be of two minds. And uh, this summer, I mean, this J term, I just got done teaching this very intense uh, two week session where I feel like I a bond with my high school um, peer teacher peers because we spent six hours a day in class. But, um, you know, it was just really exciting to work. A lot of times it's science kids who take their humanities classes in the J term or summer to get it over with so it doesn't interfere with orgo and their comm school and things like that. And um, it was really great to hear this one kid said, of course, we think with two minds and two eyes when we're with poetry. Think about the way the eye works, you know, and it was really fun to have somebody talk about the stereoscopy by which we actually see anything. And uh, also another student was, we were talking about Vincent Van Gogh, and he was saying, it was a class on self-portraiture, visual art and poetry, and he said, yeah, you know, the toxicity of those oil pigments, and he knew exactly the chemical comment, uh, content of the paints that he was using and why he probably suffered more than he had to. So. That's a long answer to your question. <laughs> but, yeah. So thank you, Paul. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you write poems? And I come from the context when I was in college and we would read poems. Yes. I'm like your dad. I, I, would, I would read the surface. Sure. But the teacher would always say, you're missing the double meanings or the triple meanings. I know. And, 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 and my thinking was, how could we tell 50 years later, 100 years later, what that poet really felt? Right. And, and, and was he just trying to express himself, as the surface says, or not? When you write, do you say, well, I want somebody to have to. No. Get my triple meaning. No, I, 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 
like, I, you know what, I, imagine having like Emily Dickinson sit in the room with us and say, that's not what I meant at all. You know, I was just trying to explain myself to myself or, you know, um, and she was the person who said, if you, if you want to, that she said that analyzing poetry or overanalyzing it was like cutting open a bird to find the music. And who would do that? Right? Why would, we, why would we split the lark to find the music? I mean, that finally we have to just let the poems be mysterious or be what they are. And, them and just enjoy them. Yeah, absolutely. Or be moved by them, be, you know, but yeah, it can go, it can be overdone. Um, and that's where you, those of us who write poems in our department and those of us who, who only criticize or, or theorize about poems sometimes butt heads because we all, you know, the, we're just writing poems because we're tr human beings trying to make sense of being alive. And we don't, aren't looking for double meanings. If they're there, if they're there because life is full of complexity. But yeah. yeah. This is more of a comment than a question. We had a great English teacher here who taught uh, me in most of us this room. And I still remember her speaking, but recently I, I lost a brother. And I just remember two great points. John does death be not proud, and after the Lord told us, maybe he's buried me no more in the bar when I put out the seat. Absolutely. There's poems help you live your life. You might not know it when you're learning them, but when you lose your brother, whatever. So, you know, I, I have to think about this a lot with my students, too. Like, I don't know sometimes, and I'm sure you guys feel this way, too, whether they get, whether they're understanding or getting the poems we're reading. But later, it'll come back to that poem that will help you cope with, um, a death or a birth or a disappointment. Yes? We had a poet here about a year and a half ago, and one of the things he spoke a little bit about was how with poetry, the importance of reading it out loud versus other literature where you can sort of get the full meaning if you're just reading by yourself alone quietly. Um, could you speak a little bit about that? Yes. I, mean, I think it's very important. Um, you know, it's hard to know what poetry is right? It's hard to define. Even English teachers have trouble saying what it is. But we know, um, well, Coleridge, Samuel Taylor Coleridge said it's uh, the best words in their best order. And um, John Keats called poetry a veil of soul making. Um, my friend Charles Wright, the Tennessee boy from K Kingsport, says that poetry is just language that sounds better and means more. And I think that's a great way to think about it. And so the music is part of that. And if you're not going to get that if you don't read it out loud, you know. And the Declaration of Independence was made to be read out loud. I mean, I think we forget that, that it was a declaration. And it was meant to be spoken. And that, you know, that's where, that's where Jefferson was the poet. He was a poet in those, in those um, treatises and in those, dec those documents, I think. And I think it's so important to read poems out loud. Um, I thank you for listening to that long one because I know that that can be very difficult. But one great thing about Kate in that poem is that she keeps moving back and forth between um, ideas about Jefferson and her son. So on, on the one hand, you're visiting a clinic, you're leaving this, you're taking the cell phone, whatever, and then the next year you, you are yourself a little girl visiting Monticello in your cheap glasses and trying to figure out who you are and how you're going to learn, and then you're back to Jefferson again, coping with the complexities of loathing slavery, but also knowing that it was going to be hard for him to not, to extricate himself from that institution at that time. Yes? Do you see any interesting trends generationally in poetry? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, when you were talking about the poems you learned from the English teacher whose room were, I guess were, this room was dedicated to her, or, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, is that there's a return, I think, of interest to formal poetry for a long time. I came of age in the 70s as a poet, you know, as a student, and it was a terrible time to come of age as a poet, I think, because nobody was observing a fulfilled line. There was everything, they took William Carlos Williams' enjambment to extremes. It got real flat, real plain spoken, and I think the poems should be musical. And um, I work with rhyme a lot. You could tell I was in the Mockingbird poem, just, I was just interested in the, the music of the, of the bird. So there is a move, an interest now, again, in received forms, in traditional forms. Um, the nice thing is that there's a whole range available to us. And there always has been, really. Um, some people are more interested in a poem that's very windexed, where they can fall through the window of the poem into what's being said and 
other people really like getting caught in the net of language and like things to happen in the language. Um, and I think if there's a trend, I think it has to do with the stuff that you guys all see, which is the attention span, right? Um, that's why somebody was joking that Dickinson's poems are arguably Twitterable, you know, because most of them are short. Um, but I think that um, either the po poems are very long and confessional and like blogs, bloggeria, or they're very short because people are texting them to one another. And that, that interests me, like what techniques, what, by what, how are people writing? And I ask my students this, and they say, well, if I get an idea, I'll, I'll either say it to myself in my phone, or I'll send myself a text. So that's going to have to affect the shape of the poem. Dickinson wrote on a desk that was a child's desk. You know, that, and I, her poems are tidy little, they're not tidy, but they're small. Um, but then Whitman kept a little notebook when he was visiting uh, pe people during the Civil War, and his poems are not little. So I don't know. It's interesting to me, though, how it's changing. I think these technologies are changing things. I know you guys are hungry and need to go. I, I just would say that when, when I'm printing a student poem, I always print out the whole document because one of the things I've noticed that students do now is they're less likely to handwrite a poem. They're usually going to be working on it in some kind of computer way. But what they often do is they have ideas down at the bottom, and they keep them down at the bottom of the page, and then they pull them up and use them in the poem. And so if I print the whole document, I'll get down to that little midden heap, you know, that little shell, that thing they're not, they've discarded. And that's where the thing that is needed to fix the poem is usually found. So um, you know, that I, that's just something that's sort of a product of technology that I've been trying to play with, with students and say, look, you, know, this, you discarded this, but this is really the stuff that needs to come back up. OK. well. I, I'm going to be around, so I'll talk to you more later. But thank you very much for listening. <laughs>